Hi, everybody. Welcome to Custody Matter Matters Live. My name is Danica Joan and my co-host, Wendy Perry. Today is this, an amazing special, we have a special guest today. His name is Ron Deal. Some of you might be familiar with his ministry and what he started, which is uh, st Smart Step Families. Uh, it certainly touched my life when I was, when I was a stepmom, uh, trying to figure out and navigate through what it was like to be a stepmom. Uh, but uh, I don't want to hold up the time because he has so many things, so many juicy things to share with you today. Welcome, Ron. Juicy things. Uh, that's a <laughs> I'm looking forward to what it comes out of my mouth. <laughs> thanks, thanks, guys, for having me on. This is good. Glad to be here. So, um, so tell me, how is it? How did you even go into creating Start Smart Step Families? Because what it, I understand, you actually have an intact family. That's correct. Um, you know, I got into this through the back doors. What I tell a lot of people, my wife says. I'm the male obstetrician of the blended family world. <laughs> if you can follow that analogy a little bit. Um, I'm one of those persons that understands the process and I try to help people understand that process. Uh, I'm a therapist. And so my clinical training is really what got me hooked, Danica. To be honest, I loved working with families. I started my career working with teenagers and their families. And pretty soon I figured out, I didn't know enough about their family. I needed to learn more. Went back to school, got a degree in marriage and family therapy. And that really helped me begin to think about uh, what's unique about step families. So 25 years ago, I started trying to figure that out. What does it look like to teach and talk and help and encourage uh, people in that journey? I did some postgraduate study with um, lots of researchers. And over, over the years, we've done our own research and have just created a whole body of books and resources and online materials. You mentioned smartstepfamilies.com. That's definitely a go-to page. I also now have merged with another very large organization called Family Life. And together we created Family Life Blended. So um, we do radio things and podcasts. I have my own podcast, Family Life Blended. So lots of resources. People used to say to me all the time, maybe you guys have heard this before, man, there's just nothing out there for us in, in blended families. Well, that's not true anymore. There's people like you guys that have created, you know, special resources for people. And here you are doing this podcast or this, uh, you know, video cast. And there's lots of things that are out there for people. You really just have to go to Amazon, do a search and you'll find it. <laughs> there is, I agree with you. There are so many great resources right now for blended families and, uh, I was online just kind of scrolling through things a few years ago and I saw this guy giving this great message about blended families and I thought who is this guy he's amazing and it was you hmm. and um, I want to talk a little more about the family life blended podcast because you mentioned that um, and it is something that, that I think everyone who uh, is interested in the topic of blended families and step families. You really have to check out the Family Life mm. Blended podcast. They are, they're fantastic. And one that I think that all of our viewers, it, I think it is a must listen, mm. was a Family Life Blended podcast that you did uh, just this past April. I think it's podcast number six. Um, and the title of it is Challenging co-parent situations and parental alienation and on, on that episode you had a couple um, Rodney and Lisa Webb and they talked about their experience of dealing with parental alienation and then you had a counselor and therapist I'm um, Helen Wheeler and again I think this is a must listen for any of our viewers that are interested in parental alienation because that particular podcast it really covered everything in parental alienation from the early signs to when your kids are rejecting you and, and acting hateful towards you and has such a great episode. And Helen, Helen said something in that episode that really I thought was um, so clever and really thought provoking. She said, children are not short adults. Hmm. And her point was that, um, we shouldn't give children adult information that they're not equipped to handle. And um, could you kind of talk to that a little bit about um, when we have these dynamics with um, blended families, 
uh, the importance of, you know, treating the children like children. They're not just short adults, as she said. Yeah, it's a developmental process to think about what information a child needs and when they need it. You will not have one conversation with your children about your family, the, their life, the changes that have already happened, the changes that may be happening currently. You will have multitude of conversations with them. And as long as you keep that attitude, you'll be okay. It's a little bit like uh, your six-year-old walking up to you and saying, hey, where do babies come from? The answer you give that six-year-old might be a little different <laughs> than the answer you give a 12-year-old or a 16-year-old or a 25-year-old. Hopefully, that's what I mean by developmental answer, right? You give them a little bit, but there are certain things that are not appropriate for them to hear when it's adult business. Don't, don't burden your child with that. They don't, they don't need that. There are times and places to say, you know what? That's for me to know. Here's what you need to know. Um, sometimes kids press us uh, around details. You know, you, you have to filter it, right, through how is this going to impact the child and their relationship with all the other people that are involved in their life. I, you know, I, I get that. And it, what's amazing to me is I, I know of some amazing single parents and I've taught their children. And I mean, and they don't even realize what they're doing. Like, it's surprising to me how many children know when um, dad's child support check hasn't, hasn't arrived. Yes. And why it is that our cell phones are getting turned off. Mm -hmm. Those kind of things. Like, those things we would protect and shield our, um, you know, our co-parent if we were in an intact family. And, we would, and we'd realize that it's not something that the children need to know why. But in the single family, it all comes up and even from good parents. That's a, it's a good illustration. And you know, I think a lot of times um, that's accidental. You're talking on the phone to a friend, you're texting somebody who you know, needs to know the information about that and you're just kind of talking out loud or reacting out loud to something that you're seeing and you don't realize your kids are within earshot and they're taking all of it in. Um, you know, one of the things that I've done as a therapist a time or two with somebody who really needed to hear this through a different set of ears is I've asked them to just do a little role play where they sit in a chair and then I say, all right, I just want you to talk to your son or daughter sitting over here in this other chair. And I want you to just tell them why, what you don't like about their other parent. So, hey, your, your dad, he's late all the time. He never thinks of anybody but himself. He's just selfish. And then, okay, good, you did a good job of that. Now add these words, and that's half of you. Mm. So all of a sudden now, they are forced into saying to their child that this is, when I'm criticizing your father, I'm also criticizing you. And that puts it in a different place, you know, in a parent's heart, and it should put it in a different place. That's information they don't need to hear, and they don't need to hear it from you, because even though dad is not in the room, they feel for dad, the criticism that you have laid on him, and they feel for themselves, oh, okay, so you're telling me I'm half of dad, so therefore this is also something you don't like about me. You got to feel the weight of that so that you put a bridle on your tongue and not say what they don't need to hear. Wow. I think something that, something that was really interesting to me in that particular podcast that I mentioned was that Lisa, she was an alienated mom. Um, but through her telling her story, you could see that she even had some room for growth, um, some behaviors that she had come to recognize and was working on herself. And so I think that's really important for us to talk about wherever you are in this dynamic, even mm -hmm. if you are the alienated parent, or sometimes we call them the targeted parent, it's really important for us to take a good, authentic look at ourselves and say, what can I change in myself to possibly make this situation better? Or am I doing some things as a response to the situation that is not really best for my kids? And and in that podcast, you said something that I wrote down. I thought it was so impactful. You said, you can't fight fire with fire in parental alienation. I thought, wow, what an important statement for us to talk about because 
it's so true. You can't fight fire with fire and parental alienation. You cannot respond with alienating behaviors when mm. you are dealing with parental alienation. And, and it's difficult, but I think that it's, it's really important that we all recognize that that we've got to work on ourselves too in, the, in these yeah. situations. In alienated situations, and you probably know better than most, um, but when that happens, it's very understandable that you would get desperate, not know what else to do and overreact, do something uh, outlandish that is an attempt to change the dynamic that's going on. But unfortunately, you give that other home, if you will, the uh, ammunition to use against you. you. You give them something they can point to and they can say, see, you saw that, right? Well, let me tell you what else they're doing. And then they can fill, it, uh, fill them up with lies. And so you do have to you do have to manage, regulate how you are presenting yourself. Now, you still have to be assertive. You still have to find ways of speaking directly to the lies that are being told or said or the untruths and, and try to fill it with truth. Um, but at the same time, if you become what they are accusing you of, mm. you're shooting yourself in the foot. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of, there can be a lot of toxic kind of relationships, whether you're dealing with a blended family situation um, or just, you know, you're being uh, targeted by your ex or your co-parent. Uh, and I would say that a lot of the tools that, that you would share with people on how to deal with, with blended families also apply to uh, like a, a, a parental alienation kind of situation. Like when the mm -hmm. child comes over toxic, the child might be coming over toxic like in a blended family situation because they came because mom doesn't like uh, me and my husband. So, you know, so the child is toxic and, and you, you don't try to set the record straight with them and because you're just pushing them in to the, the, the person who's saying uh, is being nasty. Yeah. Yeah. It's in, in that situation. And let me just make a distinction because I think there is a distinction here. So sometimes I think it's confusing. So let me just try to do this well for our listeners. Um, there are co-parenting situations that are frustrating, right? Fall into the category of frustrating. And there are, there are some that you just go, ah, it just drives me crazy. But that's not alienation, right? Alienation is in its own category. Let, let, let me do it this way. I think we talked about this on the podcast. You know, the rules of war... <laughs> Uh, are pretty evident. I've, I've always found this fascinating that two countries are at war, have some rules that they would play by. We don't bomb women and children. We don't bomb hospitals. You know, there's just certain things you don't do, right? But when you're fighting a terrorist organization, they don't give a rip about the rules of war. All rules are off. All bets are off. They can do whatever they want, whenever they want, however they want. They play unfair. Well, that's alienation. There's things that are frustrating about co-parenting. But alienation is you're dealing with a terrorist organization and you have to fight differently. If I could say it that way, you have to respond differently. And so, yes, there are some general principles about good co-parenting that still carry over into the alienation scenario. Um, but you also have to be very direct and aggressive to, to address the untruths that are being communicated. Uh, does that put the child in the middle? Does that create um, some challenging situations for your child? It does. Like, but yet, because of the nature of what's happening, you, you're calculated in it. You're calculated in how you respond. Um, but, you are, but you are also trying to break through the, the brainwashing that's going on uh, with the child. Yeah, I, I've had that conversation with many people over the years where I will explain to them what parental alienation is and they will say, oh yeah, I get it. My ex is a jerk. Yeah. And I have to tell them, you know, parental alienation is not just your ex is a jerk. It's, mm -hmm. it's way, 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 way more than that. And, mm -hmm. and parents who have been alienated, they, they could only dream and hope that right. their ex was just a jerk. <laughs> you know, it, right. it's so, it's so much more than that. And, you know, in that podcast, um, Helen says something that, that just was startling, even to me, um, that all kids who have been affected by parental alienation deal with anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, wow, that, that is just huge, something that we really need to talk about, how serious it is for kids 
Um, and, but at the end of the podcast, I just have to point this out too. Um, at the end of it, she talked about the importance of never giving up and to never stop trying. And she told a story about that, about a family that she had worked with. And it was, it's a very, very important. Uh, so anybody who listens to this podcast, please start to finish. Don't skip any of it. It's, it's really, <laughs> really such a great, really important, I think, really important podcast for people to listen to. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate that. You know, I, I do think there's hope for people and it, it's a long journey and I'm certainly not anyone who can offer any guarantees about how things will work out. Um, but I, but I've seen so many situations that eventually the child is able to see through what's happening and they're able to come around and there's a door open that's never been opened before. And so you just have to keep pressing in. I agree with that. I know my journey started in 2001 in the breakup of my family with children and, and I experienced all of the alienation for many, many years, but the staying in the course and staying in contact with them and showing them love and, and not trying to set the record straight, mm -hmm. just be intentional and in your behaviors and eventually they do start seeing it and some of them won't say anything mm -hmm. they'll be in their 20s and then you might get a glimmer of of uh you know vindication um you know but i do believe that the most important thing is that they've got to stay in in relationship with uh both parents so that they can actually step back and make their own conclusions how how great how great is it that people are talking about this now. Yes. It, it's not, it's not just people who solely have an interest in parental alienation. It, it's people who have an interest in blended families mm -hmm. and step parenting. It, it's getting to the point where anyone who has an interest in parenting knows that this is a really important subject. And so I, I really appreciate that. This is something that you definitely include in uh, your ministry. And speaking of that, uh, I know that you've got a summit coming up on mm. October 24th and 25th in Virginia, and it's part of the summit on step family ministry. And this year, uh, the theme or the, it's, the title is Step Families in Crisis. It sounds pretty serious. You know, every but, year for the last seven years, we have done this uh, annual event where we invite people who are interested in helping blended families, some of them are church leaders, some of them are community leaders, counselors, to come to this event, the Summit on Step Family Ministry, where we're teaching people about blended family living and what local churches can do in their communities. Um, it starts this year with a three-hour workshop. I got a brand new book talking about resources that just came out a week ago that is all about step family money, the smart step family guide to financial planning. My co-authors, we're going to be talking all around the themes related to that book. And then we'll be spending two days with, I don't know, two or 300 people talking about, and leaders from all over the country talking about different aspects of, of step family living. So that's an annual event. If you missed this year, we'd, we'd, we'd love to join us, have you join us next year. You've got an amazing, amazing lineup of presenters coming up at this conference. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe that people can also watch it online. Is that correct? If they can't, cannot attend in person, can they watch this online? We do another event in the spring of every year called Blended and Blessed. And that is a live stream event where you can be anywhere in the world and be with us during that day. Um, this event is a train the trainer, be there on site event. Although we do record a lot of the sessions and video uh, many of the keynotes, and those are available online uh, for purchase for like 25 bucks. You can have access to the last three years of presentation, like 60 hours of stuff for $25. So, you know, it's, it's crazy. We're just trying to help get information out there and available to people. Uh, the website for that is summitonstepfamilies.com. I have a question about that. So this is... Um, are you, is it gearing towards training uh, step family ministries or, you know, churches, or is it for the community? I know you said you have had community leaders presenting. Yeah, we do have community folks who come and be a part of it. The real, the, the target, the bullseye for us at this event is what the church can do. 
we're trying to equip church leaders to understand step families better. So many church leaders are really clueless, <laughs> to be honest. And we're trying to help them become relevant to the families in their community. So that's the bullseye target we're going for. But like I said, we have academics, we have uh, community leaders, family therapists, people from the community. They're just wanting to learn more that can come and be a part of it. Wow. I'm excited. I'm going to look at my calendar and see if I can attend. I've got That'd be great. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Wendy? Well, I know I've got a bunch of these dates on my calendar, too, because there are a couple of them coming to Texas. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got those on my calendar, and I'm really excited about it. So, um, Ron, I know there are several ways that people can connect with you. Um, but what is the best way for people to, to learn about these events and also your books and your podcast? Um, is it uh, your website, rondeal.org? Yes, I would say so. Yeah, I get a little confused with it all too, Wendy. <laughs> You're not the only one. Yeah, rondeal.org will get you to a portal where you can find everything. It, you'll be able to link to different ministries and organizations that I'm affiliated with and the different resources that we have available online, articles, different things like that. So rondeal.org. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah, I was looking at a few of the, of the resources and the updated ones that, uh, that I can share with my co-parenting instructors. I'm very mm. excited about that. This is, this is a huge thing, you know, blended families, because the predictability that, that once one marriage is over that has children, the predictability is one or both are going to remarry and mm -hmm. have children. Yeah. Either bring it, children with them or, or make more children. Right. So the co-parenting things that started with the demise of the first relationship or the death of a parent, excuse me, not a death of a parent, but when a divorce happens or a breakup, that's what I was trying to say, when a breakup happens, with a couple. Co-parenting continues on as one or both of them begin to form other relationships and recouple. And, um, it, you know, and co-parenting is affected by the new coupling relationship. You have to continue to work at it over and over and over again. I, let me, can you mind if I ask you guys a question? Sure. Sure. I love, I love turning the tables. On it. <laughs> Sorry. Hope you don't mind. Um, one of the things to me that I find myself talking about more and more these days as it relates to co-parenting is uh, the way I put it is acting divorced. I, I, I think many more and more people are finding it hard to act divorced. What I mean by that is they still act as if they're still married to their former spouse. And what, Ron, what do you mean by that? Well, um, you still call them up and expect them to answer like you would if they were married to you. You, you, you still send them messages as if they're going to do exactly what you want them to do, as if you're still married. You still have this expectation that you have a need, so they're going to be interested in meeting that need. Uh, you know, I don't think that's helpful. Like one of the things you have to do is understand your divorce. And in particular, if the other person really wanted it and you did not want the divorce, you know, finding that measure of acceptance is so hard and it's understandable that you don't want to let go. But if you don't get to that place where you let go, then you inadvertently make co-parenting harder. Hmm. You guys think that's true? Oh, I I'm so, I'm so anxious to chime in on this. <laughs> thank you for, thank you for turning the tables. <laughs> um, you're because I think what you're talking about is boundaries yes and boundaries are so incredibly important and it's a lack of boundaries that ends up resulting in what we call parental alienation mm -hmm. and it, it's just so important that we talk about boundaries especially in step families and um, when there is a remarriage and actually that podcast that i mentioned earlier it's touched upon in that podcast where um you talk about that remarriage or a new step parent often escalates alienating behaviors. That's when alienating behaviors can often escalate. Mm -hmm. And so I just think, you know, it's sometimes it's kind of unpopular to talk about. People don't like to talk about these boundaries. And, and as you said, people want to keep acting the same as they did, you know, well, why don't you answer my call immediately? And where are you? And what are you doing? And everything you do is still my business. And and all, I, I'm a, I'm a stepmom, you know, yeah. and so I can, I can come at this from every angle. 
Um, mm -hmm. Also as step parents, you know, sometimes it's hard for us to have those boundaries because we really want to love on our, our step kids mm -hmm. um, and be as involved yeah. in all of their things as the other parent. But we have got to be aware of the importance of those boundaries. One of the things I think that feeds into alienation is I'm so mad at you that I have to cut you out of my life, therefore out of the kids' lives. I have to make you hurt. I have to punish you because I'm so hurt. I'm so angry at what happened in our relationship. And so it's like you have the right now to completely control and manipulate the whole situation. Well, no, you don't, right? But, but acting divorced, here's the paradox. You would say, I'm not tied to you anymore in that way. I'm letting go of that past. I'm moving on with my life. You get to move on with your life. The kids ought to be able to move on with their life. Like all of a sudden there's a freedom to allow the children to be children, not your little pawns in your big war. But if people don't act divorced, they keep thinking they have the right to do that manipulation. You know, it's interesting you would say that, and I know that approach, but I, I just discovered the last couple of years, you know, my, my children are all in their 20s, a couple of them are married and, and all that. And I kept wanting so much to, to create harmony, because as long as it was harmony, then my, um, their dad would not, um, you know, I could keep him happy. And then if he was happy, then my kids were happy. And then, you know, and then, and I would invite him to blended gatherings, Thanksgiving, things like that. And, you know, thinking I'm doing the right thing because I didn't want my children to ever have to choose between who to invite for Thanksgiving. And then one day they said, mom, stop it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> stop it. Give you permission to, to cut the ties, to not be nothing to your, you know, your mm. ex-husband. Mm. So, that's interesting. Yeah. Wow. All right. We are down to just a couple of minutes. I would like, um, Ron, is there any la are there any last words that you would like to share? Little uh, tidbits of gold that you would like to give to our viewers? Well, you know, as it relates to co-parenting in particular, I think the good news is for most former spouses, they move towards cooperation over time. I, I think being very dedicated to manage yourself, to regulate yourself, especially in front of your children, to set aside what is old personal hurt and pain, I call that the junk of you know, the old relationship, what's personal, and just focus on being parental and um, what does this moment require of me as a parent? Not letting my personal feelings get in the way of that, if, if you discipline yourself around that over and over and over, over an extended period of time, more often than not, it moves the whole co-parenting relationship in the right direction. It moves it towards cooperation. And you can have, you can have years of misery while you're getting there, right? And it's challenging. And I never want to underestimate that for people, minimize that pain. It is hard sometimes. But if you keep going in that direction, things tend to get better. Um, there's a lot of hope in that. I think a lot of times people go, I can't control my ex, couldn't control him when I was married, never going to control him now that we're divorced. Well, that's true. You can't control him, but you can influence them through who you are. Don't underestimate that. That's where your power is. Awesome. Thank you, Ron. I, you are an amazing resource of, um, for people who are looking for hope um in the midst of their of them surviving their family you know their blended family or uh or i, I just want to thank you so much you have no idea how many lives you've touched that i know you've touched so thank you thank you danica wendy thanks for having me with you today all right take care and thank you all for joining us for another uh another week of custody matters live Bye bye <laughs>